Okay, so here we are in Unit 10 now, and we'll be discussing firearms and tool marks. So looking forward to the discussion of those topics with you. If we look at a brief history of firearms, we can see that the very first guns were actually cannons. So uh, the large cannons that you tend to think of, uh, like in our lower left there, uh, over time, these cannons were made small enough that they could be handled with hands. And so you had first the long guns, which required both hands and a wooden support, and then eventually handguns where you just needed one hand and no support. Um, and uh, they were all loaded the same way. You put a lead ball and some gunpowder into the barrel, the same end that was going to have the um, ball come back out. Um, so these were called muzzle loaders because you loaded them through the muzzle end, the firing end of the weapon. Probably not so shocking with that design was that these early handguns were not very accurate, right? They were just basically the cannons shrunk down and um, you would often have in the early days of handguns, uh, you'd have duels that were not uh, typically fatal from uh, the uh, firing of the weapon, but uh, later disease, if the uh, person was wounded and uh, the medicines weren't there to help, they'd die more often of disease than necessarily of the actual gunshot, aside from, uh, of course, our famous duel of Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. But um, the, in any event, the lead ball would spin out in a random direction uh, out of that smooth barrel. And so we see some early handguns there, the flintlock pistols, uh, an example of this early handgun style cannon. Now, as we move into the 1900s uh, and we have rifling, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, by the early 1900s, the idea of tool mark and firearm examination became widely accepted. Um, so by 1930, we have the Scientific Crime Detection Laboratory developed here for uh, looking specifically at matching handguns. Uh, then a couple years later, um, uh, of course, it existed as the BOI, the Bureau of Investigation, but 1932 is when uh, it got its more common name of uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. And then by 1969, we have the Association of Firearms and Tool Mark Examiners, the AFTE, was established. So the field um, started in the early 1900s and grew rapidly by today. So uh, it's widely established science now, and uh, it can be as um, individualized as a fingerprint from our last unit. So gauge is one measure, particularly for uh, shotguns that we'll talk about later. Uh, so gauge is uh, originally from the uh, measurement of how many lead balls weighing a total of one pound could fit into the diameter of a shotgun barrel. So um, that's how it started today. Now it's measured in decimal inches. But uh, again, uh, what you should note about gauge is the smaller the number, the bigger the barrel. And that's because if you had a large ball, like a 10 gauge, uh, you would only need a small number of those to make a pound if they're lead. Whereas if you had a, a 20 gauge, uh, you would need a lot of balls to make a pound, 20 as opposed to 10, of course. So uh, that's where the numbers originally came from. Uh, and that's what you should keep in mind is the smaller the number for gauge, the larger the diameter of that barrel. So nowadays it's uh, 0.775 inches for a 10 gauge uh, and 0.615 inches for a 20 gauge, uh, but still the uh, smaller the number, the larger the diameter of the barrel. And that goes back to that original idea of uh, a small number of lead balls that were larger compared with a larger number of lead balls that was smaller. If we look at rifled firearms, instead of gauge, we have caliber. And so the caliber is the diameter of the barrel before the rifling is added. So the land to land distance, the uh, smaller diameter of that barrel. And so uh, we would omit those decimals. Uh, if we're talking about the inch measurement, we would say the whole thing if we're talking about the metrics. So for instance, we wouldn't say 0.45 or 0.45, we'd call that a 45 as opposed to a 44 or a 357. Uh, if we're talking about a, a metric uh, in the gun, we would say 10 millimeter or nine millimeter, uh, for instance. So 
Um, the uh, one thing that students tend to get confused with here is if we were to rank them in size, a 357 sounds bigger than a 45 because the number 357 is larger than the number 45. But of course, if we're talking about decimal inches, 0 0.357 inches is definitely smaller than 0 0.45 inches. So just be aware of that. Um, ambiguity, uh, we just came off of gauge where the smaller the number, the bigger the barrel. Here we can't necessarily say the um, smaller the number, the bigger the uh, barrel uh, or anything like that because uh, of course it's true 0 0.45 inches is larger than 0 0.357 inches, but since we call it a 357 versus a 45, students will get confused about that, thinking that 357 is the larger number. So just be extra careful about that, particularly the 357 tends to be the one that causes confusion. So let's talk a little bit more about the rifling process. So the uh, rifling involves a grooving of the barrel to make the bullet spin straight. So the bullet gets a direction imparted to the spin and therefore has a truer course to the target. So uh, rifles tend to be more accurate than smooth barreled weapons. And that's why when we talked about those early handguns that were based on cannons that were smooth in their barrel uh, design, uh, they tended to be fairly inaccurate even at short distances. Uh, nowadays with rifling, you can have, uh, with a long barrel rifle, you can have, uh, you know, a range of, uh, say, a mile for sniper rifles, which is just incredible. Uh, they have to worry about wind and all of that, but uh, a good sniper could theoretically uh, hit a target from a mile or more with modern rifled firearms. So definitely an improvement over those smooth barrels to have that rifling, the grooving of the barrel to impart the spin on the bullet and to uh, make a true straight course. So backing up just a bit from those long barreled sniper rifles, let's talk about a uh, rather short barreled rifled firearm and that's the revolver. So the revolver does not have a magazine. Uh, its uh, ammunition is loaded into those separate chambers by hand and you have to open the cylinder to release the shell casing. So um, it's a very American firearm and if we go back to the single action style, uh, that's the type that requires the shooter to cock the hammer each time. So much more in line with the old Wild West days. Uh, nowadays, of course, there's the double action style where pulling the trigger cocks and releases the hammer so it acts more like a semi-automatic uh, firearm instead of the traditional style revolvers. But in either case, you're limited to a certain number of shots uh, and uh, again, you have to manually uh, load and then uh, open the cylinder to release those shell casings at the end. So um, these are, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, classic American style firearm, but um, they're limited, say, maybe six shots or more or less, depending on uh, the particulars of the revolver. So now moving on from the revolver, uh, let's talk about a more uh, modern semi-automatic style weapon uh, where the revolver had the cylinder, the uh, semi-automatic tends to have its ammunition loaded into a magazine. So that gets placed into the grip uh, and uh, pulling the slide back cocks the hammer. Uh, so that's done manually the first time. Uh, and then um, the um, trigger can be uh, pulled uh, separately from there on and shots can be fired until the magazine is exhausted and then uh, new cartridges um, could be loaded from a new magazine. So it's a very um, much higher capacity um, weapon than the revolver, and it's a lot less manual action aside from, again, pulling the slide back that first time, um, and then until the uh, cartridges all are fired and the new magazine's loaded, then uh, again, the process starts over again, but magazine tends to hold a lot more uh, rounds than the revolver cylinder would. So even though the modern handguns are rifled for accuracy, when we hear the term rifle, most of us think of these longer um, weapons. So uh, in rifles, we already mentioned that the bore is rifled for better accuracy, um, and that allows uh, someone to be able to shoot at longer ranges with still uh, a lot of accuracy in hitting their target. Uh, that's why these tend to find applications in warfare, hunting, and uh, various shooting sports. 
Um, there's lots of different types. You have bolt action, lever action, pump action, uh, semi-automatic style, brake action, falling block action, and again, that just deals with uh, the particulars of how the uh, shotgun uh, fires and then loads and fires again. But uh, for our purposes, uh, we'll focus just mainly on the semi-automatic style that we just talked about for the handguns and the revolver style handgun that we talked about first. Now, if we take a step back to those early firearms that were developed based on the cannons, uh, they had a smooth barrel, and so shotguns uh, still have a smooth barrel. The barrel's not rifled, so the shot doesn't spin, and again, it doesn't uh, therefore lead to as accurate a weapon as a rifled firearm. Um, the ammunition is a shot shell, so it's filled with multiple projectiles usually, and we see a picture of that uh, where we have shot there, so a small BB uh, type um, balls. Um, so having a number of balls, again, increases the probability of hitting a target when you do have a less accurate weapon. Um, these are still used for a lot of different purposes. They can be used uh, for home defense. Uh, law enforcement uses shotguns uh, for uh, certain circumstances. Hunting, uh, again, um, you have bird shot and things like that that uh, would involve shotguns. Uh, and shooting sports may also involve shotgun as opposed to rifled firearms. If we look at fully automatic or machine gun style firearms, these uh, are even uh, less user uh, control or user uh, interface than the uh, semi-automatics. They'll keep firing as long as the trigger is pulled back. So uh, instead of having to pull the trigger each time like a traditional semi-automatic, uh, you can just hold the trigger down and spray bullets. Uh, these are used mostly for warfare. Uh, they're not uh, typically civilian uh, use uh, sorts of weapons. Uh, although, uh, again, if you remember the Las Vegas shooting there, uh, the um, assailant had a bump stock that uh, helped to act more like a fully automatic than a semi-automatic uh, in that instance. So, um, but uh, again, officially they're used for military purposes uh, for the most part. Now, if we go back to that revolver for just a moment, uh, and let's just uh, look at uh, those different parts, at least the key parts that are identified. So the grip is where the individual holds the firearm, and that's where we'll look for things like fingerprints and uh, any other uh, potential DNA or, or uh, hair or uh, fibers that may uh, cling to that grip. Uh, the cylinder houses the ammunition into those separate chambers, and again, for the revolver, it's a cylinder. For the semi-automatics, it's a magazine. Uh, the hammer, uh, that's what's pulled back to cock uh, and then hit the firing pin in a single action or uh, just to pull the trigger to do that in a double action. Uh, the trigger is uh, what releases the hammer, so it can hit the firing pin. Again, the trigger is another good place to look for fingerprints. Uh, so that uh, perhaps when the assailant uh, was um, pulling the trigger, he or she may have left some fingerprints nearby. Uh, we've got the firing pin. That's what actually strikes the primer on the back of the cartridge to send the bullet forward. Uh, and again, that primer uh, ignites the gunpowder. Um, so that's what actually causes that pressure that will fire the bullet from the barrel and out through the um, front end of that barrel. So uh, again, it's a lot can be a lot more complicated than all of this, but these are the key pieces and hopefully that gives you a good overview, at least for the revolver, in terms of what those different parts are and what their function is. Before we move on to the semi-automatic, let's take uh, one last look at a couple uh, key parts of the revolver. So we've got the firing pin aperture, and that's the hole where the firing pin passes through to hit that primer on the back of the cartridge. And again, the primer uh, ignites that uh, gunpowder and sends the bullet forward. We've also got the breech face, and that's where the cartridge sits before being fired. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in terms of forensic helpfulness, it gets imprinted on the back of the cartridge with that uh, specialized firing pin impression. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to identify the uh, particular weapon used, if not from the bullet, then from the cartridge casing.
So moving on to the semi-automatic handgun parts and functions, uh, again, as opposed to the um, revolver that has the cylinder, the semi-automatic has the magazine, and that's what holds those cartridges, uh, which again have uh, multiple bullets in there, and uh, you can very quickly uh, change cartridges, uh, change magazines rather, uh, to uh, increase the number of uh, cartridges that can be fired in a fairly rapid time. Uh, in this case, we have the slide uh, there that's um, shown uh, just above the uh, grip there, uh, and the slide's pulled backward to cock the hammer. Uh, again, after you do that the first time, then uh, by pulling the trigger as each uh, round is fired, those expelled gases pu push the slide back and load another round for subsequent firing. So really, with a semi-automatic, uh, you uh, pull the slide backwards manually the first time, and then uh, after you um, have done that once, the um, expelled gases do that for the remaining uh, shots in the magazine. The extractor is what keeps the shell casing from the barrel, uh, and then the ejector expels that cartridge case after the bullet's been fired. Finally, with modern firearms, fortunately, we typically have a safety feature that when set, uh, the gun will not fire. And so that's a safety feature to protect uh, individuals, uh, especially maybe uh, curious youngsters um, that uh, may explore that gun. Of course, the gun should be stored safely and all of that. But uh, again, just for handling uh, purposes, when you're not uh, going to be shooting, the safety should be set so that the gun doesn't accidentally fire. All right, so now that we've had a brief discussion of some key parts and functions of the revolver and the semi-automatic handguns, let's talk about uh, ammunition. So there's four basic parts here as well. We've got the uh, primer, uh, which sparks that gunpowder. There's the gunpowder itself, which is found within the casing, and that's what's going to cause that um, bullet to move forward is that uh, gunpowder that's been sparked by the primer. There's the casing, which holds that gunpowder and projectile together. Uh, and then finally, there's the projectile itself, which uh, in the case of fire of rifled firearms, uh, we usually are talking about bullets here. So that's the anatomy of our ammunition. Uh, and uh, once that primer ignites the gunpowder, uh, it causes a little explosion, uh, right? Hot gases cause pressure to get built up and the bullet comes apart from the casing and is uh, forced at high speed through the front of the barrel. So. Uh, that's uh, in a nutshell what happens with a um, traditional bullet. Uh, we also have on the right there, uh, we have a shotgun shot there, uh, and it's a similar uh, process. Again, you see there's also a, that uh, plastic or paper, but usually plastic wad uh, that uh, is uh, there in addition to make sure that uh, the gases expel everything forward in um, the case of a shotgun. Looking at some different ammunition types, there's rimfire type ammunition, which is made mostly for 22 caliber handguns. And in that situation, the primer is on the entire base of the cartridge. Wherever the um, firing pin hits on the cartridge, it's going to uh, cause the primer to ignite the gunpowder and send the bullet forward. Uh, center fire is mostly used for handguns and rifles, and again, there the primer is separate from the cartridge right in the center, as the center fire would suggest. Now moving on to shotguns, we're looking at shot shells here. So it's the same basic parts, but uh, as I pointed out before, it includes that wad, which is used to keep the propellant and the shots separate. Uh, it's usually plastic nowadays, but it, it has been paper and could still be paper in certain instances. Um, and there also may be multiple single shots. So uh, like we see there for the bird shot or the BB shot or buckshot, uh, we have uh, a number of uh, small balls. Uh, we could also have a single projectile called a slug here, and you see that in the last two examples there at the bottom. So uh, you could have either type with shotgun ammunition, shot shell, but again, it, uh, people tend to think about the multiple single shots, but uh, of course, uh, if it is a slug, then you would have just one single mass there. We've already mentioned about caliber, again, the diameter of the bullet, 
uh, if it's a, a metric bullet, then we uh, would say nine millimeter, 10 millimeter, we'd include the metric unit there. Uh, if it's uh, one of the other styles that's based on decimal inches, then we'd just say the uh, value after the zero point. So 357 for 0 0.357. Uh, again, noticeably from our image there, you can see it's smaller than the 44, uh, even though the number 357 is bigger than the number 44, as I mentioned earlier, 0 0.357 inches is definitely smaller than 0 0.44 inches. All right, what we didn't say anything about earlier is the idea of fragmenting. So the um, shape can be altered or the um, projectile can break apart after hitting the target, depending on the composition there. So just keep that in mind. You may not uh, be looking for just uh, one single bullet at the end. There may be fragments that you need to collect uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the uh, bullet is retained in the individual if we're talking about a homicide or something like that. Um, or the bullet may have passed through depending on the uh, design and makeup of that bullet. So we do have to consider those features of the projectile when thinking about the forensic uh, application here of firearms. We've mentioned the cartridge cases a little bit already, uh, but they're commonly made of brass and they house that gunpowder and bullet. Uh, the primer is attached to the bottom of the casing itself. And then when the um, firing pin hits that uh, area of the primer, uh, it causes the primer to engage the, uh, the black powder there, the gunpowder, and uh, that forces the bullet out. Uh, there's also what's known as a head stamp, and that's found on the base, and it contains different information about the caliber size and manufacturer. So we see that down in the middle uh, picture there, uh, as well as that center um, divot is the firing pin impression. So that can be very helpful that uh, in addition to the bullet uh, getting striation markings from the gun, the firing pin impression could be another individualizable piece of evidence from a particular gun. Okay, now all of this idea of individualized evidence from firearms may seem a bit counterintuitive to some of us because uh, if those two weapons came off the assembly line, you know, they're all machined uh, with the same sort of uh, devices to, to put the rifling in. Um, they're all made of uh, the same metal and the same dimensions. So uh, why is it that uh, they're so unique? Well, it has to do with the fact that the metal itself is uh, distinct in that particular uh, barrel as it gets those uh, machined uh, rifling uh, grooves, uh, they're going to uh, have uh, slight imperfections, different flaws for different firearms. So those embedded machine marks get uh, to be unique for that particular firearm. They're different than the firearm that was produced right before or right after on the assembly line, and therefore they're analogous to fingerprints. For humans, we have these um, particularly um, individualized machine markings on the inside barrel of the guns that allow us to uh, uniquely tell if a uh, particular bullet was fired from a particular gun, even though there were uh, a number of those guns made uh, by the same process, uh, one right after the other, it still gives us that level of detail. So it's a very valuable uh, type of forensic evidence. All right, so looking into the detail there of how these barrels get fabricated with their rifling, uh, there's a number of different approaches. So those uh, grooves can be uh, pressed or cut into the board to produce the rifling uh, in a number of fashions. So the first one we'll discuss is broach cutting, and that's where pressure and a spinning broach cutting tool uh, uh, leave those cut rifling marks to uh, impart that spin and give a truer course to the bullet. There's also hammer forged um, barrel fabrication. And there we have a mandrel tool that's placed inside the barrel while the machine hammers that barrel from the outside. And that's gonna leave uh, what we call uh, polygonal or uh, rifling. And so it's a polygon shape that we can see there in the middle picture. Uh, and then finally, the um, idea of button rifling uh, where a plug tool is pressed or pulled through the barrel by a machine that leaves that cut rifle mark. So there we see uh, in the bottom right a uh, couple of different examples. So more of the polygon shape on the right and more of the traditional uh, brooch or button rifling on the left. Okay, so now how do we compare those bullets or cartridge casings 
uh, with the weapon that we suspect uh, produced them. So uh, all barrels that we'll consider have four class characteristics. So again, first we'll look at the class characteristics, then if those match, we'll worry about the individual characteristics. So first of all, we need to know about the bore. So that's the barrel diameter, uh, again, before they were cut uh, or machined or fabricated in a way to leave that rifling. Uh, the original bore diameter is uh, what lets us know the caliber, the size, the diameter there of the ammunition that we're interested in. Then we have the number of lands and grooves. So how many um, grooves were cut into the barrel and are therefore etched on the bullet? Uh, and that'll give us an indication of what particular uh, manufacturer and uh, barrel we might be looking for. Uh, Next, we have the direction of twists. So are the lands and grooves angled slightly to the right or slightly to the left? Uh, again, it would be different for different weapons. Uh, the width of the lands and grooves uh, would be another important piece of information. So all these things are measured uh, either in millimeters, which is what we prefer in forensic science because scientists uh, tend to use the metric system universally, or um, more commonly in the US, we see things in hundreds of an inch. So a 10 millimeter bullet uh, would convert to 0 0.394 inches, uh, and uh, therefore we'd round it up to a 40 caliber bullet if we wanted to do that conversion between the 10 millimeter and uh, the caliber system. So if we get a match on all those class characteristics, then we're going to go ahead and take the uh, suspect gun uh, that we uh, believe was used to fire the bullet found at the crime scene and we'll investigate the individual characteristics by uh, using that gun to uh, fire a test bullet. So uh, that test bullet would be fired into a water tank to minimize uh, the amount of damage, absorb that force safely and be able to conveniently recover that uh, bullet. And once we've recovered the test fired bullet, we can compare the striations to the crime scene bullet with a comparison microscope. So we have one uh, bullet uh, in uh, one uh, microscope uh, and the other in another microscope. And then we compare them by looking with the left eye at the test fired uh, bullet and the right eye at the uh, bullet from the crime scene. We can try to match up their uh, characteristic uh, striation patterns just like you see on this uh, screen there. So in the, the picture we have uh, the um, striation patterns aligned to determine whether or not they were fired from the same weapon. Now of course we can do something similar with the cartridge casings if that's what we have. So we have the firing pin that leaves that um, mark on the primer uh, and gets the um, bullet ultimately to uh, be ejected uh, because of the uh, gunpowder being ignited there. Uh, the so the firing pin leaves an impression, the extractor leaves a mark on the casing rim, uh, the breech face leaves striations on the back of the casing, uh, and the ejector will leave a mark on the case as well. So we've got all these different features that we can look for and try to determine um, e if we either don't have the bullet or uh, if we have both types of evidence, uh, we can look and see if we can align the um, cartridge case in those different areas to determine if the same weapon was used for the um, cartridge case found at the crime scene and a test fired uh, cartridge case that's recovered after our test firing. Now, in addition to the use of the uh, comparison microscope to compare either bullets or casings or both for a particular case, uh, there's also the uh, idea, uh, the ability to uh, compare across cases. So if a uh, weapon's recovered that may have been involved in previous crimes as well as the crime under investigation, uh, that's certainly something we'd like to know. So we have IBIS there, the Integrated Ballistic Identification System, and that stores 2D or 3D images of the characteristics found on those test-fired bullets and cartridge casings uh, uh, as well as the ones uh, found at the crime scene and those uh, fired, uh, as I said, the test fired ones from the uh, guns apprehended from the suspects. So uh, the system helps to find possible matches, again, for previous crimes uh, that that particular firearm may have been involved in. 
Uh, and it may not even be the same suspect anymore that may have been in the case of Ill, uh, firearms that are illegally uh, bought and sold on the black market. It could have been a previous owner that uh, had been using that. Uh, and so that would be a case where we'd try to uh, confront the suspect and find out where he or she acquired that weapon to see if we could uh, trace it back to uh, an original owner. So um, in particular, if you do have your own registered firearm, uh, as soon as you uh, might notice it goes missing, you want to report that right away because ultimately uh, the registered owner is who's going to show up uh, in the system if uh, there's a match found. And uh, unfortunately, it's often uh, not the registered owner who still has ownership of that firearm, but if they didn't know and didn't report it, then they could find themselves in a bit of hot water. So now, just like we had the APHIS there for the uh, automated uh, fingerprint identification systems, and those were at the local uh, and state levels, and then we had IAFIS at the national level, we have Nibin now at the um, national level, and that makes use of that IBIS uh, software that we just discussed. So this is the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, founded way back in 1999, and that allows the federal, state, and local agencies to share information from their IBIS files and um, just determine whether or not there's uh, a potential match. Uh, again, across cases, across states, uh, these uh, guns uh, can find their way, uh, unfortunately, uh, far from where they may have originated. And uh, as I mentioned before, it can be used in a number of different crimes uh, by a number of different people. And so it's good to be able to uh, match them. So even if uh, everything indicates that you've got a match for your current case, you still want to take a look and see what happens in uh, Nibin with uh, previous cases. Uh, and again, uh, Nibin is ultimately um, housed at the ATF, the Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, uh, and coordinated along with the FBI as well. So as helpful as the bullet and the casing are, uh, there's additional information that can be gleaned from gunshot residue uh, and or primer residue on the victim, the suspect, or both. So uh, components of lead, antimony, and uh, barium tend to be present in uh, these residues. Uh, and so the primer residue can appear on the hands um, just by holding the gun, not even necessarily firing the gun. Uh, whereas gunshot residue, we tend to expect uh, only for individuals who actually fired the weapon. Um, it can be collected with cotton swabs dipped in dilute nitric acid and packaged separately in plastic bags or with tape lifts for analysis. Um, and it can help to estimate the distance between the victim and the gun if it's the victim that we find the gunshot residue on. Um, if it's the suspect, again, and he or she's a, a smart uh, suspect, uh, there's nothing illegal necessarily about uh, firing a firearm. So uh, the smart criminals would uh, be at the firing range, make sure people see them to attest that they were there, uh, and um, just um, be very conspicuous about their firing of the weapons so that they have an alibi there. Uh, so it's, uh, again, not necessarily um, going to uh, be terribly damaging unless the suspect has denied firing a firearm uh, and you find the gunshot residue because it doesn't tend to last for very long. Okay, so if the suspect has fired a weapon within the past day or so, uh, then you're likely to find gunshot residue uh, and primer residue on that individual, although you're going to find less as time passes. Uh, if you happen to find it on the victim, then that's an indication that the um, victim was subject to a particularly close shot, either a contact shot right up against the, the um, skin or uh, a close shot that was within a uh, few inches of the skin. Uh, and so how you would identify that scenario would be by burn skin and burn fabric, uh, star-shaped tear in the fabric, uh, and the presence of significant amounts of gunshot residue on the victim. Uh, and uh, so we'll see a graphic picture ahead. If you're of weak uh, stomach like myself, then you may want to look away until I indicate we've moved on. But if uh, you can handle it, then go ahead and take a look here at our next slide. So last chance to turn away, and here we go. All right, so what we see in this image is a contact shot. So the uh, barrel of the gun was right up against this individual's uh, head, and um, you get that classic star shape 
and uh, also a charring from the uh, heat of the barrel uh, as soon as it's fired it's, it's very hot of course and so that causes that charring of the flesh so uh, very um, distinctive contact shot appearance and we're going to go ahead and move on if you're one who's looking away at the moment okay so you're free to look back now and we see that uh, we can determine uh, distance from uh, gunshot residue uh, amounts and appearance and uh, again so we're seeing here uh, the um, further the weapon is from the individual uh, then the um, less uh, likelihood of any gunshot residue being present uh, and the um, uh, smaller the uh, likelihood of the uh, bullet piercing through the victim as that distance increases. Okay, so one of the specific tests for gunshot residue is known as the grease test, and that's a test for nitrates, which are the result of those uh, gunpowders uh, that have been burned uh, to uh, cause the bullet to uh, eject from the weapon. So the evidence that's suspected of having the gunshot residue is pressed against photographic paper and then ironed with acetic acid, uh, which is your principal acid in vinegar. And uh, if indeed the nitrates are present there from the gunshot uh, residue, then it will produce an orange coloration that we see in our slide. Uh, so that's a positive result for uh, gunshot residue according to the grease test. Another chemical test for gunshot residue is the sodium rhodizinate test. And so in this case, we're looking for the lead residue from the uh, shot being fired. And so the evidence is sprayed with sodium rhodizinate and then a uh, buffer is added to get the pH correct. Uh, and if it is indeed positive for lead residue, you'll get a pink color. Um, this is uh, actually just a presumptory uh, test to get that pink to confirm it uh, for a confirmatory test. Uh, HCl, hydrochloric acid, is sprayed and a blue color will appear if indeed you have lead residue. Uh, so if you get that pink color but then the HCl test does not result in a blue color, uh, then you didn't actually have uh, the lead residue that would be indicative of a gunshot residue result. Uh, you need to have that follow-up with the HCL uh, turning blue to confirm it. All right, so scanning electron microscopy, SEM, is typically used to determine if primer residue is present. And so this is microscopy, it's using electrons instead of light, but it's still the same principles of microscopy. So you'll actually get an image and you can look at the size and shape of these particles. Uh, and uh, because it's uh, typically hooked up to EDS, energy dispersive spectroscopy, that sensor can identify the particular elements and their amounts, their relative amounts present. So the lead antimony, uh, and or barium that are present would be conclusive of the primer residue and uh, you may even be able to get the specific manufacturer if you have a commercially made primer that uh, has a, a set uh, percentage of lead antimony and barium that you can uh, confirm and test against with the SEM EDX or EDS as it's sometimes called the energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy uh, that would identify those elements and their amounts. Okay, so now let's think about in the field if we happen to find weapons, uh, the proper procedure for collecting those weapons. First of all, you'll want to wear gloves. Uh, we mentioned that uh, if you test fire the weapon, you can uh, be able to identify bullets and casings by a fingerprint-like uh, method. Well, here we're looking for actual fingerprints, so we want to keep our fingerprints off and we want to preserve any fingerprints that may be on the weapon. So that's why we wear gloves. Uh, we pick the weapon up by the trigger guard or by the grip, uh, again, for safety's sake. Uh, we remove the bullets from the revolver and note each chamber the bullets came from and package each bullet separately because if we're dealing with a revolver, uh, the um, suspect had to load each of those bullets by hand and therefore we may have fingerprints on the bullets themselves. Uh, if it's a semi-automatic uh, instead of a revolver, then you'd want to remove the magazine uh, and also remove any uh, bullet that might be in the chamber and uh, make sure that you have, uh, again, noted position and um, noted that it's live ammunition if that's the case. Finally, if you happen to find the uh, gun underwater, the person 
uh, thought that he or she was smart by tossing it into a body of water. Uh, well, if it, we're still lucky enough to recover it, then you want to package it in a container of that same water. So if it's fresh water, you want that fresh water uh, in there. If it's salt water, you want that same salt water that it's been sitting in. And you want to put enough of that water in to completely submerse the gun until you get to the crime lab to uh, dry it out and hopefully uh, keep it in a way that it can still be fired. Uh, the rusting doesn't happen very quickly underwater, but if you were to take it out of the water, uh, it could rust uh, fairly uh, readily in air, and that's why I want to keep it underwater until it can be properly dried at the crime lab and then hopefully test fired to identify if it is indeed a gun from that crime or through Nibbin from uh, any other prior, prior crimes. And finally, as we wrap up our uh, firearms portion of this unit, uh, collecting the bullets themselves. So we've mentioned that those striation marks are critical to being able to hopefully match the bullet to the weapon. So we do not want to do anything that would compromise those striation markings. So if the bullets are in a wall, for instance, cut around the bullet and keep it in the wall and then uh, you know, slowly remove that uh, area around the bullet so that you're not disturbing those striation marks. The worst thing you could do is take a pair of steel forceps and grasp the bullet to pull it out because now you're going to make markings on from the forceps and that's going to compromise those original striation markings. If the bullet's in a victim, then the uh, doctor, the medical examiner, uh, or his or her assistant will remove that bullet during the autopsy. So uh, whatever you've seen in TV or movies, uh, don't believe it. Uh, if the officers there uh, prying bullets out of walls or victims, then uh, they're not following proper protocol. All right, so now let's transition to the tool mark section of this unit. So tool marks are marks that are left on softer objects from harder objects. So tools will leave unique marks behind and uh, that can be helpful in forensic investigations. Of course, tools are what separate us from uh, the other animals, or at least most other animals. Uh, some of the higher primates have figured out how to do some things with tools, but uh, humans have been aged by their mastery of materials, right? You have the Bronze Age or the Iron Age uh, based on our ability to manipulate uh, various materials. So um, obviously tools have been important to our historical development as a people and the anthropologists nod to that by their uh, aging of uh, civilization by the tools that have been used. Okay, so tools will make specific marks when they cut or scrape a softer surface. So we generally make our tools out of hard materials like steel uh, so that uh, they can um, cut uh, small, uh, softer uh, materials. So if we look at a compression tool mark, so that's an outline of a tool. So uh, for instance, hammer into wood. So wood's a softer material. The hammer is probably made of steel, which is a very hard material. We can also have a sliding tool mark. So that leaves parallel striations when the tool slides across material. So think about a screwdriver or a crowbar, uh, leaving those sorts of gouges as it slides. And finally, we can have a cutting tool mark. So those would be striations when the tool cuts through another material. So if you think about a pair of uh, steel uh, scissors cutting through uh, softer material, paper or uh, wood, or uh, again, uh, whatever uh, particular materials, even another metal, a softer metal like steel uh, scissors cutting through aluminum, for instance. All right, now just like we had striation marks on bullets, we can have striation marks for the tools. So unique marks on a tool uh, are made from those microscopic imperfections. And again, uh, even though the tools are mass produced, just like the barrels of the guns are mass produced, you still get small imperfections that uh, can uh, individualize a particular tool, just like we individualized a particular uh, gun. So the tools are often the first things to look at when searching a suspect's home. Um, most suspects know that the guns can be matched and they try to get rid of them or make them uh, so that they can't be fired. Uh, but um, a lot of suspects don't realize that tools can be uh, very valuable pieces of forensic evidence. And so they, if you have a good tool, you keep it, right? They may have their tool hanging back in their tool shed, uh, even though it may potentially link them to uh, a crime. So 
Uh, if you do have reason to believe that that's the tool that was used, uh, the tool in question is uh, used to scrape a piece of lead, which is a fairly soft metal. So uh, again, most tools are hard enough to leave an impression there. And you can compare those um, markings that on the test piece of lead with the markings from the scene uh, and uh, use the comparison microscope just like we did with uh, the uh, bullet comparisons or cartridge casing comparisons uh, from the first part of the unit and you can uh, hopefully determine uh, either yes it is a match or no it is not a match. All right, now with tool marks in particular, it's not always convenient to seize the entire object that has the tool mark. So oftentimes we'll make casts or impressions of that tool mark. And three common materials that can be used for this purpose are dental stone, which is uh, calcium sulfate. It's also known as alginate or gypsum or plaster of Paris. Um, and you may have experience with that from an art class or something like that. Um, there's permlastic uh, and polyvinyl siloxane, which are uh, again, different types of polymers uh, that we'll discuss in a moment. So each of these materials has its advantages. Uh, dental stones, particularly low in cost, which makes it uh, well suited for larger uh, casts or impressions. Primlastic and polyvinyl siloxane tend to be a little pricier, but they give really fine detail, so they have their use as well if you really need to capture all the detail from that fairly small uh, impression. Okay, so dental stone uh, is a paste made uh, by taking that powder, the powdered calcium sulfate, and a little bit of water uh, and making that paste so that it can be applied to the impression and then it later hardens. Um, it actually hardens fairly quickly, so you do have to work with this uh, fairly quickly because it is time sensitive. Um, that, that's an excellent material for dental or bite marks uh, on a victim. Uh, shoe prints, uh, especially uh, say shoe prints in um, snow or mud where it's only temporary, you're going to want to definitely capture that. You can't just take that entire footprint. You'll probably damage it trying to remove it. And if it's snow or mud, uh, then uh, you may lose it uh, as it either warms or uh, if additional rain comes and makes it unusable. The same sort of thing with tire prints. So tire prints are usually temporary, right? They're in a material for a, a little while. And if you don't grab an impression of them, you might lose them for good. So uh, for use in the snow, uh, a wax, snow print wax is sprayed first for either shoe prints or tire prints in the snow. And we'll take a look at that in a moment. Okay, so here we see the um, calcium sulfate uh, dental stone type material being used to fill in at the top left to fill in a shoe print in the dirt before the rain comes and washes that away or animals disturb it or whatever else might happen. Um, we have uh, down at the bottom uh, the snow print wax there. So it's a nice red color so you can definitely contrast it against the white snow and see that you've uh, sprayed completely before you add the uh, calcium sulfate uh, paste there to harden and make an impression. And then in the middle we see an impression of a tire track. So uh, various impression materials are captured through uh, a, um, an inexpensive uh, casting material like dental stone. Okay, so the other two that we mentioned uh, previously, permlastic and polyvinyl siloxane, uh, they both come as two-part mixtures. So you have two tubes of the material uh, and you mix them in equal amounts. Um, and they give you typically uh, some more working time compared with the uh, dental stone material. So you get a little longer on them. They stay nice and rubbery for a while uh, and you can uh, adhere them uh, as we see in the slide uh, with some sort of um, stick or uh, uh, wand type of uh, applicator. Uh, and then uh, you'll be able to remove them after they've hardened in uh, several minutes. So uh, these are great because they're a nice rubbery impression with lots of fine detail, much better than you typically get with dental stone. And so they work really well for smaller impressions where that fine detail is critical, like a bite mark or a scratch uh, on a surface. So uh, that's when we would prefer the Permlastic and the polyvinyl siloxanes, which do tend to be a little more expensive uh, compared with dental stone. Now, sometimes the material itself just doesn't lend itself well to a traditional uh, material like permlastic or uh, dental stone for an impression. So, 
For instance, if we think about footprints on paper, or wood, or carpet, linoleum, concrete, these are things that aren't going to uh, play nicely, so to speak, with our traditional casting materials, then we instead would turn to the electrostatic dust lifter. So in this case, we um, lay down a plastic mylar film over the area that we expect to lift the print. Uh, and then the plastic gets charged and lifts the dust from the print uh, because of the electrostatic charge Im uh, impressed on it by this um, uh, the um, instrument itself uh, that causes buildup and charge, a lot like a photocopier, if you know how photocopiers work. So that sort of idea uh, can capture a um, an impression, a, a footprint, uh, for instance, on a surface that would not work well with a classic impression material. Now, shoe print's not necessarily one size fits all, right? You've got lots of different tread patterns for the shoes, and we see some examples of those on the screen. You've also got a lot of different tire tread patterns for tire marks. So um, the um, pattern that you get from a shoe print or a tire print can help lead you uh, toward a particular manufacturer and hopefully uh, in a direction that gets you closer to the uh, suspect behind whatever investigation is being uh, followed. And here we see some additional examples of some uh, shoe prints. And again, even within a manufacturer, uh, we see a few Nikes there in the top left uh, and middle left. Uh, even though they're all the same manufacturer, they have decidedly different uh, patterns and uh, even the swoosh marking is in different positions. And then that's not even to mention other manufacturers like we see Adidas there in the middle right and New Balance at the bottom. So um, a shoe print can be very telling at least uh, to um, lead you in a direction about what particular manufacturer uh, of shoe you're looking for. Now, if we turn our attention to tire tracks, we can uh, get some information out of the tire track that uh, maybe you know a lot about or maybe you don't know so much about, and that can be the aspect ratio, which is the ratio of the height of the sidewall of the tire to the width of the tread times 100. So uh, if you own a vehicle uh, and uh, you've had to change the tires, which you should do from time to time as that uh, tread gets worn, right? Uh, you don't want to be caught uh, in upstate New York with uh, bald tires in the winter time. So the um, set of numbers that you need to follow, you can't just unfortunately go to the store and buy the cheapest tire there is, right? Uh, or we'd all be riding around on 13 inch tires, but uh, you need the one that fits your vehicle. Uh, and you can usually find that information in the door well of the driver's side if you don't have your uh, user manual handy. So for instance, if your tire size is 185 slash 60R14, well, that set of numbers means something very specific. So the 185 part uh, or the first part of whatever your particular uh, values are would be the uh, tread width in millimeters. So this is a place where we're using millimeters in the US. It's wonderful, right? Um, then after the slash, we have the aspect ratio, which we just defined as the ratio of the height of the sidewall of the tire to the width of the tread times 100. And then finally, that last value uh, is the diameter of the wheel. So unfortunately, we're back to inches here for wheel diameter. So uh, there you go. If you didn't know that information, uh, hopefully now you do and you understand that it's important you get the right set of numbers so that your uh, tread width and your aspect ratio and your wheel diameter are correct for your vehicle. Okay, so as we sum up the uh, other portion, the tool mark portion of our unit here. Uh, what can the item or the impression tell you? So for footprints, uh, they can give you, and again, we would photograph the a native footprint as well as the footprint with a measuring device to help us with ideas of length and width and shoe size. Uh, we can also get the sole pattern that will lead us to the manufacturer as well as uh, potentially some unique wear patterns, right? Does the person have fallen arches or do they toe in? Or is there anything else interesting in that wear pattern that might lead us to a particular suspect? For tire tracks, uh, we can get, again, uh, pictures of the um, native uh, tire track as well as pictures with a measuring device, annotated photos of the uh, tire track to get information about length and width and aspect ratio that we just discussed, tire size, tread pattern, those can all hopefully lead us to 
a particular vehicle and uh, then we uh, hopefully can find our desired suspect once we have the suspect vehicle identified. Finally, the tools themselves, we mentioned a few different things, right? First of all, look for fingerprints on the tools, right? If the tool has been used, uh, then uh, potentially the person handled that tool without gloves and may have left some fingerprints on it. Uh, there could also be items adhering to the tool, right? If it's a sharp tool, it may have fibers or hairs or other uh, physical evidence clinging to it. Uh, so be careful to inspect for that and to package it separately. Uh, the entire tool or the impression can possibly be matched to that original tool mark. So we want to make sure that we uh, package the tool appropriately, or if we can't package that entire tool, then at least take an impression of the uh, area of interest on the tool so that we can hopefully match it to the original tool mark. And finally, despite what you may have seen in TV and movies, you would never try to fit that tool to the original mark, not in the field, uh, not even at trial, uh, because you don't want to damage that original mark. That's what you have to go by. And so everything's done with impressions. So if you can take an impression of the tool, an impression of the mark, and show by comparison microscopy that they do match, then uh, you never actually have to fit the tool to the mark to make your point. So. Hopefully you've enjoyed this unit on firearms and tool marks. And if you have um, anything that you'd like to share with me, uh, then please do uh, send along. I know some of you may have specialized knowledge in either the firearms or the tool marks end of things. And I'd be happy to hear from you if you want to send me an email uh, about anything you think I've um, left out or uh, something that uh, you think may be more clearly stated another way. I'd love to hear that information. Otherwise, I'll be looking forward to working together again in the next unit. Take care, everybody.